Welcome to a presentation. Uh, we are going to be discussing the use of elastical chrome rubber in drum and batch plants. Uh, the purpose of this uh, video is to give you a quick introduction into the process setup and operations at your plant. For additional detail, there will be contact information uh, at the end of this presentation, as well as a website location where you can get additional information. So let's begin. Uh, for starters, let's talk about what uh, what we call engineered crumb rubber or ECR. Uh, engineered crumb rubber is a recycled tire crumb rubber product. Uh, this is material that is sourced from old uh, car and truck tires, uh, and it is ground to an extremely fine powder. Uh, the average size of the powder is about 1 50th of an inch. Uh, the ASTM description of the material is that it is a minus 30 mesh material. Uh, this material will flow easily uh, when it's put into a feeder or when it's emptied out of, a, out of a bulk bag. And this chemically modified crumb rubber product is added like a very fine aggregate or mineral powder during your mixed production process. The reason that we use engineered crumb rubber is that the addition of this product into an asphalt mix produces a rut and crack resistant pavement, uh, much like a polymer modified asphalt, only without the polymers. Uh, the reason that uh, producers like to use this technology is that it allows you to modify your mixes on site as opposed to buying a terminally modified uh, binder. And it is typically significantly less expensive than polymer modified binders. Now, why do you want to use ECR uh, in mixed designs? Well, the addition of small amounts of ECR uh, cuts costs and it improves the quality of the pavement, as I mentioned a moment ago. Now, ECR mixes, uh, these are mixes, it could be dense graded, open graded, porous, whatever you want. Um, it handles like a standard hot mix. So in the old days, when you added rubber to a mix, it tended to get very sticky and difficult to work with. Uh, this material is going to handle just like a regular hot mix. And as I mentioned before, when you put this material down in a road surface, you're going to see less running and cracking compared to a standard hot mix asphalt. Um, when we put this material in with open graded mixes, uh, the rubber increases the viscosity of the binder enough so that there isn't a whole lot of drain down in open graded mixes. Uh, the pavements as a result are more durable um, and it makes your operations quite a bit simpler. Uh, we don't require the storage of a special binder and a special tank. Uh, rather, uh, we use a fiber feeder to add rubber into your process. Uh, performance, as I mentioned, is comparable to polymer modified asphalt and of course is less expensive. Now, I'd like to give you an idea of, of, of exactly why we put rubber in uh, into mixes. And what you're seeing here is a, uh, a DCT, which is a, a cracking test. Uh, this is a jig that is set up to take a notched sample of mix or chill binder to crack it uh, from that notch by pulling it apart and then to study how much energy is required to break that block in half. And what you're looking at is a standard workhorse binder. This is a 6422 binder. And as you can see, when the jig pulls, it takes about five seconds for the jig to pull that brick of a binder apart. Now I'm gonna give you another view now of a polymer modified on your left. Uh, you're looking right at the base of the notch. And if you recall that 6422 binder cracked in about five seconds. Well, the polymer modified binder took that same 6422 binder. It bumped it up to a 7622 binder. So this would be your two grade bump polymer modified uh, asphalt binder. And instead of requiring about five seconds to break in half, this material requires about four and a half minutes to break in half. Um, I'll, I'll point out a couple of things that are of interest. One is you can see kind of the glossy finish of the, uh, of the polymer modified binder on the uh, pictures to the right. And you can see that it looks quite similar to uh, unmodified PG6422 uh, binder. And again, it takes four and a half minutes to break this brick apart. Now we're gonna take a look at what happens when we put crumb rubber into that binder. And again, a slightly different angle, but if you watch the notch, uh, this material will gradually pull itself apart. And unlike the polymer, which fractures cleanly uh, and shows what, what's called brittle fracture, this is more a ductile tearing of the binder. 
And if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see what happens to that binder face when you put 5% and then 20% rubber in. You can see that it's a fundamentally different material. And whereas the unmodified 6422 binder took five seconds to break, and the polymer modified 6422 binder took four and a half minutes to break, this material requires 35 minutes to break apart. Okay, and this is the same 6422 binder. So what's happening, <clears throat> you can see graphically uh, on the very far left, you can see that uh, the uh, uh, standard 6422 binder unmodified has got a fracture energy of about 7.8 and higher is better with that score. In the far right, you've got the polymer modified 7622 binder. And then in the four center measurements, you can see five, 10, 15, and 20% rubber. And you see how much additional fracture energy is added into the binder, which then is added into the mix as well. Now, if you take a look here at the fracture faces of that binder, on the left, you see polymer and it's glass-like. And that is because the polymer rubber, and it is rubber, uh, melts into the binder and it's gone. It doesn't exist as a discrete particle. But the crumb rubber uh, that goes in actually has to be ripped from one side or the other of the fracture in order for the fracture to propagate through the binder. So essentially what you're seeing here is that the rubber is providing substantially greater resistance because we've got to, we, the crack has got to either go through rubber, which it cannot, or it has to go around the rubber grain, which takes a lot of time. And so essentially that increased fracture energy is telling us that these binders are gonna be more resistant to cracking, and for that matter, more resistant to rutting when they're put out into the field if rubber modification is used. So <clears throat> when we talk about uh, putting this process into, in, into the works, uh, ECR is typically shipped to your, uh, to your plant in pallet mounted bulk bags. Bags weigh about a ton apiece. Uh, they're, they're loaded into the feeder that you see in the picture here, and the rubber is blown into your drum through, a, uh, through this fiber machine. Uh, the rubber binder mix interaction takes place during the mixing of the mix or the production of the mix itself, storage in the silo at your plant, and on the truck headed over to the site. Uh, generally speaking, we run our plants at about 325 degrees and it takes about 30 minutes for the reaction to take place, give you a, a highly effective mix that is gonna do well in the field. I'm gonna show you just a quick video so you can see the process and operation and get a better feel for this. Again, as I mentioned before, we ship it in one ton bulk bags. Uh, the bulk bags are loaded into the surge hopper that you see on a fortified fiber machine that is set up to uh, receive the rubber. Um, uh, typically once every half an hour to an hour, uh, the bottom of a bag is cut out with a uh, razor knife at the end of a pole. The uh, rubber drains smoothly into the chopper, as you can see coming out of the bag. Uh, and then when the feeder starts to run low, it calls for a refill. And that surge hopper is used to refill the feeder and keep your plant operating at uh, peak efficiency without any shutdowns at all. The feeder is highly accurate. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, when the feeder uh, augers the material into an airstream, it's blown up typically through a pipe stub in the wrap collar or close to the wrap collar. And uh, the mix that comes out of the plant handles like a regular hot mix. It's not sticky. It does not hang up in the silo. And as you can see here, when it's sliding off the bed of the truck, it does not adhere like a traditional rubber mix would adhere to the, uh, to the bottom of the truck. So it's nice and smooth in its uh, operation and it leaves clean beds behind. Now, when the material is loaded into the paver, uh, we see, again, a nice, smooth laydown process. Uh, this material is being laid down at approximately 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, it's not tearing or splitting in any way as it comes out of the paver itself. And when we put roller uh, rollers across this material, unlike the traditional rubberized mixes, the rollers aren't going to pick up anything in the way of uh, debris on the roller itself, and they certainly won't pick up the pavement itself. So this is pretty so significantly different than the old rubberized asphalt that you're, you're used to seeing in, uh, uh, in uh, days gone by back in the 1990s. So um, this is not a new technology. We've got approximately uh, 
of somewhere in the vicinity of 8 million tons down on the ground. And as you can see, we've got projects all over the United States, and we're also very active in Europe as well. Now, in terms of setting up and operating at your plant, when this technology is deployed, if you're doing it for the first time, uh, you'll bring in a fiber machine. Uh, and uh, the fiber machine typically needs to be about 50 feet or so from the plant itself. Uh, and it needs to be placed on a level surface. If it's not placed on a level surface, you will uh, manually level the feeder. Uh, you're gonna need to have the ability to lift that feeder off the truck. Uh, feeder typically weighs about 10,000 pounds or thereabouts. Uh, there are different feeders out in the marketplace. So we're just gonna give you generic guidance on, on this process and on its setup. Now, once the feeder is put in place, you pull power to the feeder. Uh, and then you calibrate the feeder to make sure that uh, the, the feeder is uh, metering rubber out at predictable rates. Uh, with calibration and power setup finished, um, you, uh, you're, you're given guidance ahead of time on the power and signal requirements for the unit if you're going to install it as part of your plant control system. Uh, usually for first time efforts, we, we don't need to uh, connect it to the plant software. Uh, we have a, a tethered control screen that can be extended into the control shed and it can be used to control the unit from the control shed if desired. Now the, uh, the feeder settings can be adjusted on the feeder or it can be adjusted in the control room uh, using some very simple controls on the screen itself, the touch screen. Uh, and uh, the uh, calibration and tracking setup instructions again are, are, are provided by the feeder. The feeder has the ability to track uh, uh, in rubber input rates every minute or so, uh, depending on what kind of time intervals you're looking for. Uh, it can track throughout the entire day and tell you exactly how much rubber has gone in at any one point in time. Um, once you once you have your unit up and operational, um, you're going to uh, run the rubber feed rate calculations, which are gonna be coming from your quality manager. He will tell you how many pounds you're going to uh, need in order to uh, uh, treat each ton of rubber. Uh, and uh, the uh, calculations and setup then are put into the, uh, uh, into the plant uh, operator's uh, file book, essentially with the, uh, with the option of the uh, numbers to be adjusted on the feeder as you speed up or slow down the plant. Uh, once you have the, uh, the the necessary setup and your feeder is operational, uh, you uh, you load the feeder. You want to make sure that there is there's a low level alarm. You want to make sure it's visible to the plant operator in the event that you're starting to run low on rubber in the feeder itself. Um, under standard specifications now that are coming out with this process, uh, they require for permanent setups that you actually have a flow interruption function in place in the event that uh, uh, the rubber feed is interrupted for any reason whatsoever, and that, of course, would cause a plant stop. In terms of the plant operating conditions, really the only modification beyond the standard changes to your job mix design uh, and formula that you're using for uh, operating the plant uh, will typically run the plant at approximately 325 degrees, and we require that the mix sit essentially at or close to that temperature for approximately 30 minutes before it goes into the paver. Generally speaking, in a drum plant, it, it's almost impossible to get a mix out into a truck over to uh, a, uh, a paving site and into the feeder within 30 minutes. But we, uh, we strongly recommend a 30 minute minimum time frame for allowing the uh, reactions between the binder and the rubber to occur. Uh, that dwell time, 30 minutes, plant temperature 325 is pretty much a standard in the industry. Now, when, you, uh, when you're operating a large projects, uh, and we operate up to you know, 150, 200,000 ton projects, <clears throat> uh, when the feeder is left out overnight, uh, there's typically a, uh, an awning uh, that can be pulled over the top or a tarp that can be pulled over the top of the feeder to protect the rubber that is sitting in the feeder. Uh, and uh, when you're finished with the feeder, if you're not going to leave it there, uh, you have the ability to clean the filter or feeder out just by blowing the material out of the feeder uh, into a, a bulk bag, uh, or you can shovel the material out of the feeder into a, uh, into a bag for storage and reuse at a later time. The rubber uh, deliveries that you get uh, don't need to be stored inside unless you're going to have them on site for an extended period of time. The bag tops are designed to shed water. 
so that uh, in the event that there's a passing rain shower while the bags are still outside, the, the rubber is not going to get wet. Also, this rubber is extremely fine, so it's very difficult for water to get into the mass of the rubber itself. So between those two functions, uh, the bags are okay to use outside, at least on an interim basis. If you're going to have them out there for months at a time, we would recommend inside storage for the bags themselves. So that really is about it. Uh, nothing more complicated than that. This is essentially turn the unit on at the appropriate feed rate for the plant operating level. And uh, you're making a modified asphalt mix. And when you turn the feeder off, you are no longer making a uh, modified asphalt mix within a matter of seconds. So it gives you on off modification and the ability to produce the equivalent of a polymer modified asphalt mix using recycled materials and crumb rubber. So that will give you at least a quick snapshot of, of what's going to be required to set your plan up. Uh, if this is new to you, uh, we are available to provide some on-site support and training as needed. Uh, we'll certainly work with you and make sure that the uh, intelligence on operating the system uh, uh, properly from day one, uh, you know, we'll do our best to provide support for you. Uh, this is going to be available on video, so you can always uh, click in on this and, and check in just to kind of get an update if it's been a while since you've run. And again, uh, with the feeder supplier and with our company, Asphalt Plus, uh, we'd be more than happy to help you uh, if you need assistance in getting up and operational again. Uh, my name is Red Clark. Uh, you've got my contact information there. Please feel free to reach out, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much.